This program is brought to you by Stanford Hospital and Clinics. Welcome to Stanford Medical Minutes. I'm Dr. Stephen Chang, a neurosurgeon at Stanford, and I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Stefan Mendia, a spine expert in my department here at Stanford. And we're here today to talk about spinal disorders. Stefan, can you tell me a little bit about the type of spinal disorders that are treated at Stanford by you and your spine colleagues? Absolutely. The way I would categorize the varying diseases in spine are the following. Probably the most common form of disease is degenerative or wear and tear of the spine. Uh, additionally, uh, there's disease processes uh, evolving around scoliosis or deformity of the spine. So one can have scoliosis at a young age or throughout adolescence, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, or even uh, in more advanced age settings. Um, additionally, there's tumor involvement of the spine. Given the fact that the spine is composed of significant amount of um, osseous or bony segments, it's very common that disease ends up metastasizing to the spine, necessitating treatment. And finally, spinal trauma. That's, again, intuitive. I think everyone is comfortable with that. Uh, that's simply uh, injuries, blunt, blunt force, motor vehicle accidents and that sort that can injure the spine or the contents of the spine and the spinal cord. Okay, great. Let's talk about this, the first category you mentioned is degenerative spine disease, this kind of wear and tear on, on, your, on your back. I presume that's the most common type of, of spine disorder that you would see at Stanford? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, degenerative spine disease is ubiquitous and uh, again, it's a, it's a wear and tear of the, of the joints involved in the spine. The spine is a, is a fascinating structure uh, biomechanically in the sense that it's composed of a number of different joints, all of which can suffer the same uh, sequelae uh, as patients with osteoarthritis involving their hands or rheumatoid arthritis and, and that sort of process. And it's most commonly involving the cervical and lumbar regions, so the neck and back regions. One of the first things that we try and do at uh, the Stanford Neurospine Center is to evaluate the prospective patient in detail with regard to what specifically is causing their pain. As I alluded to earlier, because there are so many joints present, it's really essential that the clinician definitively pinpoint the pain generator. And I think embarking on any treatment prior to doing that and doing that expeditiously and accurately uh, is premature. Additionally, over the last decade or so, more patients have received spinal surgeries, and some of those results are lukewarm precisely because of this point, um, be, being that it's very difficult to diagnostically pinpoint the pain generator. That's something that we focus a lot of our attention on at the center, and we do that through utilizing various uh, neuroradiology um, schemes, MRI sequences focused in on uh, the disc space, uh, looking at facet joints and so forth, uh, working with our colleagues in physiatry to do various diagnostic maneuvers that can help us tease out these pain generators. And I think that's the, 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 uh, the standard by which uh, spine disease is treated. So just, just because I have back pain, that doesn't necessarily mean that I need to have spine surgery. Is that what you're trying to say? Absolutely. In fact, back pain is caused by a number of different uh, processes. It can involve simply uh, muscular pain, right? The weekend warrior, so to speak, who uh, overworks his muscles or overutilizes uh, their muscles. Additionally, it can be caused by uh, a deformity process by which a patient's posture uh, can inadvertently uh, disturb the biomechanical balance of the spine. Uh, patients can compensate by virtue of uh, their knee positions and their hip positions to try and offload pain and worsen back pain in the muscular sense. So it's a complex interplay between uh, a number of different issues, be it posture, muscle involvement, 
and also other disease processes like spinal tumors, which, would, which can cause instability of the spine or compression of the spinal elements, like the spinal cord. So if I, if I did end up needing to have to have spine surgery, I've been hearing a lot about minimally invasive spine surgery you know, with, with things like an endoscope. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Of course. Minimally invasive spinal surgery is a technique by which we utilize muscle splitting techniques. The goal is to minimize tissue trauma to the surrounding areas, minimize the, uh, necess the pain medication a patient utilizes after surgery. We try and reduce the hospitalization time by virtue of this technique. And additionally, it's, it's really a, a means by which we try and to accomplish the exact same operation done in an open fashion, but utilizing technology to perform it in a minimally invasive fashion. So the objective really is very similar. A good open spinal procedure should, it does not necessarily uh, mean that it's less ideal than a minimally invasive procedure. The goal is really the same, to perform an excellent procedure and address that specific pain generator to mitigate the patient's symptoms. Okay, great. Um, I want to follow up with, the, with another category that you mentioned, which is, which is uh, spine tumors. Uh, are, are, can you tell me a little bit about these type of tumors? What are the most common type of spine tumors that you see in your practice? Sure. Uh, by, by and large, the, the broadest tumors that we see are metastatic tumors. Tumors uh, in patients with breast cancer, lung cancer, uh, various GI cancers. So these are, again, very, very common, again, because the spine is composed of, of a number of osseous segments. So the tumors metastasize to these bony regions. What can happen when a tumor metastasizes to the spine is that it involves the bone and subsequently can compress the spinal cord. If the spinal cord is compressed, a patient can experience sequelae like weakening of their legs, loss of sensation, inability to walk or, or, or balance themselves, and these types of lesions really need to be treated in a, in a way in which the spinal cord and the, and the neural elements are freed from pressure. So that's the central principle in treating uh, metastatic spinal tumors. Additionally, primary spinal tumors are also a lesion that we treat. These are much less common because, again, metastatic disease is so prevalent. But giant cell tumors, Ewing sarcomas, um, multiple myeloma, uh, lymphoma, all of these processes we evaluate uh, at the spinal uh, tumor center. Great. What about, um, what about what's called deformity uh, of the spine? You mentioned that the uh, uh, initial part of our conversation, scoliosis, which um, is I think probably the most well-known deformity of, of the spine. Is that something you see a lot of in your practice and, and how do you manage those patients? Sure, scoliosis is certainly a common condition and I would classify it as being a disease process where there's a wide spectrum. Again, it's a term that's used fairly liberally and can encompass a uh, disease process in a baby like a congenital scoliosis or a neuromuscular scoliosis, and can be on the completely opposite side of the spectrum of being a degenerative scoliosis. So uh, a, a senior patient that is having a lot of back pain because they're leaning forward so much and they're so kyphotic, kyphotic meaning leaning forward. Scoliosis is really a global problem and one that is not dealt with in a specific segment only. One needs to take into account a patient's cervical spine, thoracic spine, and lumbar spine, as well as their hips and pelvis to really understand this process in detail. So again, scoliosis has a very wide spectrum, and one of the things that we do in our evaluation is look at a patient's gait and balance and posture, put that in, in the uh, spectrum of their imaging findings, utilize various software that allows us to reconstruct the spinal anatomy, rotate it in a different fashion, and almost do a virtual surgery 
before being in the operating room uh, to allow us to achieve an optimal result. And I think this, these types of technologies are emerging and are being more and more uh, frequently used by clinicians. Great, and, and finally, um, I wanna talk a little bit about spine trauma. Um, uh, I think that sounds pretty straightforward to most people, spine trauma meaning some sort of accident or injury causing a problem with the spine. Can you, can you tell me about what, what types of spine trauma you see in your practice and how you manage those patients? So with regard to spinal trauma, patients that are transferred to Stanford for management of their spinal traumas um, are often are, are embarked upon a set protocol whereby we work with the transfer center team, the helicopter units, expediting a patient's transfer to our insti institution, the neurocritical team, which helps us manage a lot of the important intensive care unit issues that arise. And finally, we work in conjunction with uh, fellow neurosurgeons to manage cranial injuries that can uh, also present with spinal lesions, as well as addressing the primary spinal injury, which is something that myself and my colleagues do as spine surgeons at Stanford. Great, well thank you for your time today, Stefan. It was very enlightening. My pleasure.